Okay, you guys ready for me to say something super provocative, super controversial, something which is going to get all the leftists clutching their copies of Das Kapital, like their crucifixes and I'm a vampire? The road to socialism begins with universal basic income. Did you feel that? That's the hackles of all the Marxists all across the internet raising at once. Put the books down. What, are you all expecting me to burst into flames or something? You know, Marxism isn't the only left-wing ideology out there, right? You could always read another book. No, I don't need you to quote from it. Hey everyone, my name is Jacob, but the trolls, they call me Snowflake. You know, when I first brought up UBI in online left-wing spaces, I never knew the sort of backlash you could get for advocating for it. Let's just say that I won't make that mistake very often anymore. But it did convince me that I needed to make an episode about this, about how I envision it, try to debunk some of the arguments against it, and some of the misconceptions around UBI which are brought up both in left-wing spaces and just in general. And it still does shock me that I need to make this video, that UBI is still looked down on so much much within left-wing discourse, but hopefully this video will help make the case for UBI and show that no, it actually does have a place in leftist discourse, and that it actually could be our most powerful tool ever. Now before we begin, I think it would be beneficial if you all try to open up your minds and set aside all of the assumptions and the ideologies that you may hold tightly onto. From my own experience having discussions around UBI in online left-wing spaces, most of the people I've talked with that have issues with UBI really seem to come at it from a very heavily Marxist perspective. That's maybe not entirely universal, that could just be my own isolated experience, but that's what I've seen. And if you look at UBI through the lens of something like Marxism, yeah, it doesn't hold up, but you're honestly not giving it an actual chance in that case, are you? You're honestly kind of setting it up to fail, and if you actually want to engage with topics and ideas, then you have to actually be willing to give them a chance. And you know, just because something doesn't line up with Marxist thinking doesn't make it bad. So I ask that anyone who has really strong hang-ups around UBI, or who believes that UBI is, I don't know, counter-revolutionary, neoliberal pacification of the enslaved masses or something like that, to at least try and keep an open mind, and to try and at least give me a chance to convince you otherwise. If that's too much to ask, then you know what, that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion, even if it's wrong. But in all seriousness, I'm a huge advocate for multiplicity of activism. Everyone is allowed to have their own pet cause and their own ideas of how society needs to get there. We can acknowledge that our own method of trying to change society has its own flaws, and we can critique one another's methods in good faith but still support each other. I'm not saying that every single leftist or left-wing person needs to do what I want them to do. I'm just here to make the best case I can for something I'm passionate about, something which I think hasn't been given an actual fair chance in leftist spaces, and something which I feel has a huge potential to change the world. This is what I believe, and hopefully I can win you over to my side, but if I can't, then at the very least, I hope I can show you that I've put a lot of thought into what I feel is for the best of our species as a whole, that I have good reasons for coming to the conclusions that I have, and why you should respect the conclusion I've come to. And if not, and you just can't fight the urge to call me a bad leftist and drag me before the internet revolutionary court for counter-revolutionary tendencies, well, the comment section is open and my Twitter is in the description. Dear worst bitches, love you. So, for those who aren't entirely sure what universal basic income means, and to make sure that we're all on the same page, the idea of universal basic income is, at its most basic, an amount of money that is given to people from the government every month or so, sometimes every week, as a replacement to programs like welfare, employment insurance, and disability, with no strings attached. That's one of the major ways that UBI differs from traditional forms of welfare, because welfare comes with all these requirements and rules attached, the violation of which can result in the loss of welfare, specifically you know, earning more than a specific amount of money. If you 
you earn more than that, you lose all of your welfare and you could even wind up worse off than you were before. UBI also gives a lot more money than welfare. It's intended to be enough to actually make an impact on people's lives rather than just enough to make sure they feel punished and desperate. UBI is unconditional, which means that payments may vary with age. Most models have you receive full income once you turn 18 or 21, whenever the age is for full adulthood. But there are no other conditions placed on income. It doesn't matter your age, your gender, your employment status. Some models limit it by income, so if you're like super wealthy already, there's kind of no point in you receiving UBI, but at the very least, super wealthy people don't receive any more than anyone else. Under most models, UBI is automatic, meaning that it's paid directly into the bank account every week, every month, whenever the payment comes in. UBI is non-withdrawable, meaning that no matter what happens with your income or your employment status or your even criminal status, you will always receive UBI. Most models have it paid on an individual basis, not on a household or family basis, meaning that if you get married, for instance, you both get individual UBI. You don't just get one flat UBI between you two. And most models for UBI have it labeled as a right. Someone who is a legal citizen will receive UBI as long as they meet the qualifications for citizenship. UBI can be done in several different ways. It can just be a flat payment across the board where everyone in a society receives the same amount of money. But what I'm an advocate for is what's called full basic income, which is where everyone receives enough money to pay for the basic essentials that we all need to survive in our society. You know, basic housing, basic food, utilities, etc. If you want a great overview of UBI, I highly recommend Kierkegaard's video on the subject. I know some people have issues with Kierkegaard's work, but if you need a primer, then I think that that's a really great place to start. And UBI actually isn't necessarily even a new idea. Sir Thomas More's Utopia argues for guaranteed income all the way back in the 1500s. And it was a pretty common idea within radical circles throughout the 1700s, with people like American founding father Thomas Paine being an advocate for it. But the idea has really only gotten moving within the last 50 years or so, and the idea has really only started to gain widespread public support within the last few years. We've currently had several UBI pilots in different countries, one of the more famous ones being the one that they had in Finland, though UBI advocates like me would say that Finland's pilot was kind of set up to fail, but they also had one going on here in my home province of Ontario, which was going swimmingly until 30% of Ontario voted in a conservative premier who scrapped the pilot after he said he wouldn't. And there are UBI like programs in many different countries, maybe even in your country. Canada is currently looking into bringing in something for seniors called the Guaranteed Income Supplement, which is a negative income tax, basically a step down from UBI, where the government gives you money on top of your income to get up or above the poverty line. The US has a very similar thing called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Brazil has Bossa Familia, which is closer to UBI, but has the condition that children go to school and lessens the higher the family's income is. And even conservative pundits and uber capitalists like Elon Musk, the CEO of Uber, and Mark Zuckerberg have begun to advocate for UBI as a way of keeping labor costs down. Though, that's obviously been something which has understandably soured a lot of leftists to the idea of UBI. But, as I said, this is a video which is trying to show that UBI is still good in spite of that. So, why don't we use that as a segue to try to address some of the concerns that people, both leftists and not, have around UBI. So, as I said, a number of conservatives and alt-right figureheads and hyper-capitalist companies like Google and Uber have been looking into UBI as a way to pay their employees less and gut welfare. And yeah, this is true. Like, I'm not going to say that it's not when it is. But conservative praise for UBI is not universal at all. There's loads of conservatives who look at it, you know, as a communist plot to destroy Western civilization, just like they do illegal immigrants and trans people. But also, too, just because conservatives advocate for something doesn't mean it's not good or doesn't have the potential to do good. Up to 70% of conservatives and registered Republicans are in favor of universal health care. Does that mean that universal health care is bad now and something that we need to stop advocating for? No, it's a sign that our society is coming to a consensus on something which has been proven to improve people's lives. And that's something we should celebrate. That's a victory, lefties. And really, the reason why conservatives are able to advocate for UBI is because UBI, at its most basic, is largely apolitical and not inherently progressive or conservative. The progressive or conservative aspects are almost always determined by how you structure it and the reasons behind UBI. UBI isn't bad because conservatives like it, it's just that they like a particular version of UBI which they have constructed with the intention of gutting social programs. And there are loads of different things that leftists advocate for, like unions, worker-run collectives, and even revolution which, if you let them fall into the hands of fascists, can be transformed into weapons against marginalized and disenfranchised people too. That doesn't mean they're bad, that just means that it's important to structure them in a way 
way that helps rather than hurts people. And in fact, maybe the fact that so many conservatives and tech bros are so in love with their version of UBI means that whether leftists like it or not, UBI may wind up being inevitable. I mean, sure, if capitalism is going to fail or we somehow manage to smash capitalism, it probably won't matter, but does anyone see any of that happening anytime soon? So bearing the unforeseen collapse of capitalism, if UBI may be inevitable, don't you think it's kind of important to counter with our own version of UBI and get people rallying behind it instead of just sitting back and letting people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos decide what all our lives are going to be like? Wouldn't it be smarter, more proactive, and frankly much more merciful to try and leverage that conservative support for UBI and get people behind a model which will actually improve people's lives and shield them from being under the thumb of the likes of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos? I know which I'd prefer. Frankly, the most valid criticism I've come across in my research and discussion around UBI has been the concern around people with disabilities and medical problems under a UBI system. After all, these people frequently have severely higher medical costs than the average population. So if disability is going to be rolled into UBI, what is there to stop these people from having all their UBI money used up on medical costs? And this is an absolutely valid criticism, and I think it shows that UBI can't just happen on its own. We need to set the groundwork for UBI before it comes. UBI absolutely needs three things in order to make sure it doesn't disenfranchise certain groups like disabled people even more. UBI needs universal health care, it needs rent control, and it needs proper tax rates on corporations and on the wealthy. It needs universal health care so that medical costs don't eat up all the money that people receive. It needs rent control to make sure that landlords don't just price those who rely on UBI for their income out of the market, and it needs high tax rates on the wealthy and corporations to pay for it. You see, I actually don't think that disability and most medical costs belong under UBI. I see UBI as something which takes care of all the basic necessities and costs which everyone in our society needs in order to survive, housing, food, etc. Not everyone is going to need medication or things like wheelchairs or surgeries, so I think that disability services and medical costs should be dealt with under the umbrella of universal health care. If you need a wheelchair or medication, it should be given to you because those are things you need to function in our society, but those aren't things that everyone is going to need. UBI is more meant to look after what everyone in our society is going to need. And before all the Americans start griping about how universal healthcare is never going to happen, and that means UBI is stupid, I find that a lot of left-wing discourse online is very heavily America-centric. So like, yeah, having to have rent control and universal healthcare in place before UBI can happen is a tall order. But it's not our fault that your country is a crypto-fascist hyper-capitalist hellscape. Out here in the real world, pretty much every other developed nation on the planet has universal health care. Most of us have rent control, and overall, there's a lot of support across the board for corporations and the wealthy paying their fair share in taxes. Hell, some of us already have UBI to a limited extent. Just because you have catching up to do doesn't mean that the rest of us can't keep moving forward here. And even in the country where free market capitalism goes to die, all three of these things have pretty high levels of support across the political spectrum. So the public support is there already. It's just a matter of mobilizing that support and turning it into law. Probably the most common criticism of UBI across the political spectrum, from conservative to centrist, and even left-wing people, is won't it cost a lot of money? But I think that it's particularly interesting when it comes from left-wing people, because we are leftists. When have we ever cared about what shit costs? Like, now, all of a sudden, leftists are concerned about the depth of the movement's pockets? This is often an argument which is leveled against programs like universal healthcare, things that we all agree are good, and yeah, initially do require an investment, but will quickly pay for themselves in savings. If that that's how it worked for programs like universal healthcare, why would it be different for UBI? Look at some of the problems that UBI can easily solve, and just think of the savings that UBI will bring. Under UBI, where everyone in our society is given enough money to afford housing and food, homelessness has the potential to be virtually eliminated as the massive societal ill that we know it as today. Many leftists say that the way to solve homelessness is to give people houses, and you basically are doing that with UBI. You're not giving them the house, but you're giving them enough money to afford a roof over their head. And letting someone remain homeless is not just an affront to human decency, but it also costs, on average, about $70,000 a year just to leave someone on the street. And most of that is in medical costs. And the longer a person is homeless, the higher the cost becomes. I think it was the Vancouver Sun which did a profile of a woman who had been on the street in the downtown east side of Vancouver for 17 years. And the year they profiled her, she wound up accruing over $200,000 in medical costs. 
So just by giving someone twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year instead of leaving them homeless, you can save enough money to give UBI to about three and a half other people. Now multiply that by the hundreds of thousands of people who are homeless within our countries. In Canada, about one hundred fifty thousand people will use a homeless shelter every year. That's a huge amount of savings already, and that's just the savings in homelessness alone. Think about the health benefits that the average person could reap from a system where homelessness is no longer a concern. Stress is one of the number one killers in our society right now. Imagine a world where, yeah, you may still stress about stuff, people will still have high stress jobs, but you won't have to worry about being homeless, about starving, about being completely and utterly destitute and dying on the streets. More than three quarters of all Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, and Canadians have one of the highest debt income ratios in the world. Just think of all the stress that every single person in the Western world currently lives under, and imagine how much happier we could be as a society where, if you lost your job, you wouldn't have to worry about starving on the street. Not only would we probably be happier as a society, but we would probably also be a lot healthier. Imagine how many people in our society are literally killing themselves right now with stress just trying to stay afloat. Under the right system of UBI, all that disappears. Under some predictions, UBI could pay for itself through medical costs alone. UBI could also gut the prison system, which again, costs billions of dollars every year. We as leftists believe that most people are driven to crime as a means of providing income for themselves. Certainly, racism absolutely plays a huge role in it too, but under a system where everyone, regardless of race, is given enough money to survive, you wouldn't need to engage in dangerous or illegal activities in order to make ends meet and stay off the street. Certainly some people would still look to crime as a way to supplement their income, but I'm pretty sure that that would be a much smaller number than we already have to deal with. UBI provides the opportunity to overturn literally centuries of economic disenfranchisement, and at the very least, seriously kneecap the industry of prison labor which destroys so many lives and futures. And not only will it save people from lifetimes of incarceration, but it will also save money, because prisons and housing people in them cost a lot of money. And that is just if everything stays the same. That is not including the increased economic activity from people potentially using the newfound freedom to improve their situation by going back to school, starting their own business, or even just going to the doctor more. UBI has also been floated around as a means of compensating stay-at-home parents, especially stay-at-home moms, for labor that they do which they are not paid for. UBI would also be a boon to people escaping abusive relationships, because now they don't have to worry about ending up on the street as a result of leaving, which is a massive reason why so many people stay in toxic relationships and is something which happens on a regular basis. Again, all of that has the potential to go away. Like, yeah, it will cost the government a lot of money to give every single person in our society twelve dollars to $15,000 a year, but not only do we get at least a good chunk of that money back through savings, but that money isn't being spent and disappearing, like say, I don't know, military contracts. Because the money is most likely going to go towards things like housing and food and not just sitting in a bank accruing interest or being spent on guns or tanks. It's going back into the economy and eventually back to the government through taxes, hence why UBI needs proper marginal tax rates. In fact, leftists, UBI is a direct and efficient way to redistribute wealth from the wealthy to the workers. It is literally just giving people the money that they create and that they are owed. The issue of money is also related to several other criticisms of UBI, like won't inflation go up? Answer, no. No it won't, because of how inflation works. Inflation is caused when you print more and more money and put it into circulation. Thereby, every piece of money in circulation in the system right now becomes less valuable overall. UBI is not about printing more money, it is about redistributing the money already in the system so that everyone has their needs met. It is literally exactly what socialists have been talking about for decades if not longer. And hence Hence, no inflation. Another money-related criticism is, won't corporations just raise the price on everything? And I think it's very important to point out that this is basically one of the arguments that is used against things like raising the minimum wage. And like, no, not if they're not allowed to. We live in a system where businesses are competing to have the absolute lowest prices possible. I don't see how that's going to stop just because UBI is brought in or people's wages go up. But if people are worried about that, we could certainly include clauses in the UBI framework that state that corporations can't just raise the price on everything just to exclude certain people from their business. Or, you know, there is always just public pressure. I mean, people don't like having to spend more than they already have to. And I don't think that they'll be all that happy to see suddenly everything more expensive. People are not capitalism automatons that are just like, this is the price, I must pay this. People get pissed when they find out that stuff has suddenly gotten more expensive. Besides, stuff is already getting more expensive now anyways, and wages or standards of living haven't gone up in decades. 
And speaking of wages, people have also asked, won't wages go down when UBI is brought in? Now, that's certainly what people like Elon Musk and the CEO of Uber want to do with UBI, but that's not UBI doing it, that's them doing it. Huge difference. That's shitty business owners being shitty business owners. And like, yeah, it could happen, but first of all, I don't think that most people would appreciate that very much, do you? I don't think that anyone suggesting that or caught doing that would be very popular at the very least. But actually, even better, I think UBI actually has the potential to make wages go up. Okay, put aside all the Marxist thinking and everything for a minute. Close the book. Close it. Close it. Now step away from it. Further. 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 No, you can't pick it back up yet. Okay, so here's my theory of capitalism. Here's the snowflake theory of capitalism. One of the foundational threats that underpins capitalism is, if you don't allow yourself to be exploited, then you will starve. Capitalism holds the threat of homelessness, of starvation, of ruination over people to get them to consent to being exploited and being used and abused by the system for the betterment of the wealthy. But if you don't have to let yourself be exploited to survive, do you? For most people, no, they wouldn't. Because people have something called dignity and integrity and, and not liking working for shitty jobs that they know don't respect them. What proper UBI does is that it allows that choice to happen. It allows people to not have to take that shitty exploitative job if they feel that they're not going to get enough out of the deal and that they're not being treated fairly. So, since people don't have to work to survive anymore, people now have to want to work. Those people who ran those shitty jobs now suddenly have to make people want to work for them. And how do they do that? They do it by giving them higher wages, by giving them more benefits, by giving them better working conditions. UBI, when done properly, takes the power away from companies, corporations, and business owners and places it where it belongs, with the workers. Instead of companies now being allowed to make ridiculous demands because everyone is so desperate for work, companies will now have to work to get you to want to work for them, even having to compete against one another, which will drive wages and benefits up even higher. And even if they do wind up lowering wages, under a proper UBI, it's not that severe an issue because you'll survive. Under UBI, all the money you make is a bonus. All the money you make is yours to do with what you want to improve your quality of life because all of your essentials are paid for. Under UBI, lowered wages no longer mean the difference between life or death for people. Now, a response to this will probably be, well, won't corporations just automate all the jobs then or hire foreign workers? And while the topic of automation is a tricky one because you can't really predict what will happen in the future, you can only really guess. And it is something which is brought up often in favor of UBI, but I would say that first, there will always be some jobs that can't be automated. Not without the invention of, you know, highly advanced artificial AI. And really, the same goes for foreign workers. The fact is that most foreign workers are not sufficiently educated to be able to do most jobs within our modern job market. And this is why most foreign workers do jobs like picking fruits and vegetables or construction. Jobs which they most likely would have had back in their home countries. It would be quite an expense to provide them enough training training to make them be able to do everything that someone born and raised here can do. And most companies don't even want to train workers as is. It's supposed to be about saving money after all. It's just like all the conservative scaremongering of illegal immigrants taking the gerbs. It's not actually true because illegal immigrants can't take all of the jobs. You guys don't actually believe that, do you? But going back to automation, I disagree with Richard Wolff on the topic of UBI, but I think he is absolutely correct about automation not being inherently apocalyptic and having the potential to free people rather than a tool to disenfranchise people. Wolff sees it like this. Say you have a factory with 10 employees and you bring in a machine which automates five of those jobs. Under the current system, you get rid of five of those workers, but it doesn't have to be that way. Wolff proposes that instead of getting rid of those five jobs, you keep all 10 employees and you pay them the same salaries as before, you just have them work half the time. You still profit from the increased efficiencies, but they now also have much more free time. This is the utopian dream which those at the tail end of the Industrial Revolution thought would have happened by now, and which didn't happen because, you know, capitalism. The problem isn't automation, the problem is the culture around that automation. But we can say that we have to change our culture all we want. Actually changing the culture is a very, very different matter. Praxis is a lot harder than theory, and whether we like it or not, automation is already happening, and people are already losing their jobs to it, and not just low-skilled work too. Driverless cars may be threatening drivers and truckers, but more sophisticated algorithms and AI are even being predicted to make lawyers and accountants obsolete. It's all in the works. The capitalist elite are 
are already working to put the means of production and the means of achieving a livelihood well out of the reach of most people. So again, maybe we don't have much choice in the matter. We can sit around waiting for the rest of society to wake up, waiting for the revolution to just spontaneously happen any second now and let the progress continue completely unrestrained, or we can be proactive and make sure that if this is going to keep happening, we can at least put in safety measures to make sure that people can at least survive, and which I believe can provide the foundation onto which we can push for cultural change, but without just leaving so many people to suffer. I'll get into how I feel UBI can form the foundation of that change at the end of the episode, but we'll move on for now to the question of won't benefits be cut under UBI? This question comes from how UBI will operate. The idea being that you bring in UBI and then you fold all of the programs and government departments that UBI is replacing into it, like welfare, disability, and homeless services, etc. But no, overall, UBI doesn't inherently mean a loss of benefits. It depends on how UBI is structured. Conservatives are absolutely looking to UBI as a way to cut benefits overall, most definitely, but there are also loads of ways that UBI can be structured to provide even more benefits than before. It all depends on how it's structured and on who is doing the structuring. As I said before, conservatives and capitalists already have their plans in the works, so are we going to just sit back and let them cut benefits that way, or are we going to be proactive for once and counter with our own, so that we maybe can get in and cut them off, or at the very least provide an alternative when the conservatives start making their move? One of the more particular criticisms of UBI I got in my discussions was, won't unions have less power? First of all, unions are another example of things which leftists love, which have the potential to be corrupted if conservatives get their hands on them. But no, they won't necessarily be weaker. I actually think that UBI could actually make unions stronger. Because the two reasons that workers don't join unions is because one, they need literally every last cent of their paycheck and they can't afford the union dues. And two, they're worried that if their employers find out that they are in a union, then they'll be or face consequences. With UBI, none of that is a problem because they'll already have enough money to survive, so they can give a little bit of their paycheck to their union if they want to, and they don't need to worry about losing their jobs because it's not the only thing that's keeping them afloat. So if they get fired for joining a union, it's fine and their families won't starve. Losing that fear of losing their jobs would probably also remove barriers for workers who want to form unions and who want to demand more rights. You don't have to worry about walking out on your job and getting fired for it because again, you'll be fine. What does it matter if you lose your shitty job if you're already going to be fine? Here's a somewhat interesting one coming from leftists. Won't immigration skyrocket? Good. We're leftists. I thought we liked immigrants. The more immigrants, the better. Aren't we supposed to be destroying Western civilization and slaughtering the white race through immigration? Like, yeah, sure, maybe, but again, immigration is good because now that's more people to contribute to the economy overall. And if it becomes really widespread, then that'll most likely force other countries to adopt UBI too, to stop their citizens from leaving. And for those worried about undocumented immigrants, their rates probably actually won't go up because undocumented immigrants aren't going to be able to receive UBI because they they're not registered with the government, so there probably won't be a spike in undocumented immigrants, and it will probably actually encourage people to go through legal channels so they can claim UBI. A common criticism I've seen from the left is, won't UBI cause a stronger government? Now, first of all, I'm kind of okay with a big government overall, but that's just me. I feel like the way the system is now, if the government isn't doing something, then corporations will. And I would much rather have government doing it than corporations, because at least government is supposed to look after people. It doesn't always, but that's the system not working the way it's supposed to, I feel. Whereas corporations have absolutely no obligation to look after humanity beyond their CEOs and shareholders. But I am sympathetic to people who are hesitant about the idea of big government, so I understand the concern. And again, it just depends on how it's structured. Rolling a lot of programs and departments into UBI means that there's going to be fewer people running UBI than there are running all these other programs. So there is that. And because a full basic income, which I believe is the best model, has to provide for basic housing costs, it has to be tailored to where people live. A person in New York is going to have way higher housing costs than someone in, I don't know, Little Rock, Arkansas, or I don't know. So you're going to need decision making and power on a local level. So you could have the overall picture handled by the centralized government, but the day-to-day -day operations of the system can be done on a local level, distributing the power across the system. UBI can centralize power, but it can also diffuse power. It just depends on how you structure it. 
Here's another big one. Won't it be easier to take away or for conservatives to cut? Well, yes, it will be, but conservatives are going to want to cut any program. That's what they do. That's what their entire ideology is based around. And when have we ever done or not done anything based on how conservatives will react to it? Yes, they will try to cut it. But the counter to that is, will people let them? I'll tell you something. Those people who were on the basic income pilot here in Ontario that were recently kicked off of it are now mobilizing and fighting to get it back. You want to see the impact that UBI can have on people's lives? Go check out Humans for Basic Income on Twitter. You'll see what these people are fighting for. People don't like it when their lives are made harder. Look at wages. Yeah, wages haven't been raised in decades, but they also haven't been cut across the board, have they? Because politicians know that suggesting that will tank their career. People, in general, are not capitalist automatons going, capitalism says I must work for less, I will obey. If someone tries to take money out of their pockets, they will be rightfully pissed off. And you could actually say that it's a system which is less likely to be cut because unlike programs like welfare, it affects everyone. People cut programs that aren't for them. But if you extend those programs to everyone, then people are much less likely to cut something which is putting money into their pocket. Next, won't it make people lazy and not want to work? Oh my god, I can't believe the number of times that this response popped up in left-wing discourse. Come on, people. No, it won't, because people will still need something to do. Most people want to feel valuable and that they're contributing to society as a whole. Sure, there will be people who will just sit on their ass all day and who will spend their money on drugs and alcohol. If you want to see some, I will happily point you towards two of my uncles. But surely, you're not going to say that everyone else shouldn't get it just because a small number of people will abuse it. Surely. Alright, final argument everyone. It's almost over, I promise. It doesn't take capitalism head on. We're still relying on capitalism. I feel like this is the least substantial critique, not because I don't think it's valid, but because I feel like it's the least specific. You could take this argument, apply it to almost anything, and make it look bad. And I tend not to like arguments like that because I think it's important to be specific with your critique. Otherwise, you create an argument that's difficult to engage with and difficult for others to understand. Probably one of the reasons why this was the most common critique I came across in my research. This is an argument which can mean whatever you want it to mean, and you don't need to explain yourself or actually support your assertion. But as far as I've been able to glean, the argument refers to the idea that UBI treats the symptoms of capitalism, not the actual problems of capitalism itself. And, well, my response to that is fourfold. First, okay, does everything we do have to assault capitalism head-on? Like, is it not also important to try and help people and make their lives better in more immediate ways than only exclusively working towards a goal that is like a century away at this point? Secondly, what do we actually do that actually does assault capitalism head-on? Not really a whole lot. That's actually a really short list. Third, in my opinion, this argument has shades of a pretty toxic and vile aspect of left-wing discourse, which I see pop up every now and then the idea that we shouldn't improve people's lives because if people are happy then they'll never join the revolution when it happens so we need to make sure that people's lives aren't getting better or even worse we need to let their lives become worse or make them worse so that they'll be sure to join the revolution i hope everyone listening to this doesn't need me to tell them how absolutely horrible this particular ideology is and how manipulating people into our movement even if that movement may be in their best interests is not okay no matter what your reasoning may be people may call me a bad leftist for not being pro violent revolution and liking UBI, but as far as I'm concerned, if you see this as the toxic horse shit it is, you're fine in my books. And fourth, isn't treating symptoms actually still really important? Like, a lot of leftists compare capitalism to cancer, so let's go with that. Yes, in cancer treatment, you do tackle the problem head-on. You go into surgery, you do rounds of chemotherapy, but you also work to treat the symptoms of the cancer, and perhaps, even more important, you work to treat the side effects of the treatment itself. Chemotherapy is chemically carpet-bombing your body. Surgery is cutting you open and removing pieces of you. That shit is horrible and wreaks havoc on your body. So a doctor prescribes you pot to stop making you feel sick after chemo, chemo, they give you anesthetic and pain medication so you won't feel pain when you go under the knife and when you're healing. That's what UBI is. UBI is the anesthetic before the cutting begins. UBI insulates the people in our society who are liable to be hurt most so that they don't get hurt and they don't need to worry as society is reshaped around them. And with people being safe and secure and now no longer being victimized by the worst that capitalism has to offer, we have a foundation to reach out to people from. We can say, hey, this system, which now means 
you don't need to stress about being homeless, which has given you more freedom and security, which is literally putting money in your pocket. This is a taste of the world that we have been trying to build for decades. This is what a world without capitalism will be like, but even better. UBI is a soapbox upon which we can evangelize our worldview and make converts. UBI doesn't necessarily make people more invested in capitalism because, well, never underestimate a person's tendency to bite the hand that feeds them, especially if they can see that it is hurting everyone else. But I think that people are honestly not as tied to capitalism as we on the left like to think. I think that the biggest barrier for the average person is that they are just worried about the unknown, but letting them experience UBI allows them a frame of reference from which to properly judge what a world without capitalism has in store for them. Remember the snowflake theory of capitalism, one of capitalism's fundamental fundamental threats is, if you don't let yourself be exploited, you will starve. And this is still an accepted idea in our society, but UBI runs counter to that. UBI says, no, it doesn't matter whether you work or not, everyone in our society has the right to survive. It has the potential to really cause a massive shift in what society believes, and what it feels is acceptable. It has the ability to make people understand the true depths of capitalism's cruelty, and it does that by showing people what it is like to be free of it. And once this shift has occurred, and once society as a whole becomes more open to our ideas, UBI provides a stepping stone to bigger and better things. From there, we can go, okay, now that we all agree that everyone deserves the right to survive, that is, our right as human beings within our society to exist and survive, what if all of us don't just deserve to survive, but to actually have a good and happy life without having it tied to whether or not we work? Once people get used to and accustomed to UBI, we push for more. We push for more rights. We push for more freedoms, for more opportunities, more benefits and privileges. And we keep going. And think about it. When everyone in our society can afford food, can afford housing, why bother even charging for them in the first place? And when you're not charging for anything in our society, you don't really need the concept of money, do you? We keep going. We build off of the structures of UBI, making people's lives better and better, giving them more freedom and more power, and make people less and less reliant on work and capitalism in general for their livelihoods, until we essentially hollow out capitalism from the inside out. And once that happens, we can shrug off the shell of capitalism like the dry and withered husk it has become. It's basically a cliche at this point that basically every single leftist is just sitting around waiting for the revolution to happen, but no one knows how to start it. You want to know how to start the revolution? Here it is, right here. I've just given you a roadmap to the end of capitalism. Literally, a step-by-step -step guide to the liberation of our species and the betterment of our society and the demise of capitalism. You're welcome. Look, I understand that it may not look how you thought it would, but are we really in a position to turn away a perfectly good revolution when it has been laid out before us? The revolutions that so many leftists are infatuated with are messy and dangerous, and they're not the magic bullet that many believe they are. A violent revolution is basically the opening act. It is the demolition stage of the renovation of our society, and anyone who has done renovations will tell you that the demolition is the fun and easy part. The hard part is reconstructing everything from the ground up again, and quite frankly, the way that much of the online left behaves on a regular basis doesn't exactly fill me with confidence in these people deciding how society is going to work. Plus, revolutions, if they even work at all, and very very few of them ever actually do, are incredibly messy affairs, and they almost always leave the most vulnerable in our society caught in the crossfire. I've had discussions with revolutionary leftists and asked them things like, well, what happens with disabled people, or people who need things like medications or medical treatment during the revolution when everything is in disarray? And you know what? Not one of them has given me an answer to that question, or at least an answer that made me feel like they actually ever gave it serious thought. Now, maybe my experience isn't universal. That could very much be the case, and I hope it's not. But then I ask, what would you do? How will you protect those who are most in danger from being targeted? How will you make sure that those who need a system of assistance around them will get what they need to function or even just to survive? How will you make sure that the most vulnerable members of our society won't become the first martyrs of the revolution, whether they agree to it or not? And if you don't have the answers to those questions, maybe you need to ask yourself why you don't. Because I did very much like to make sure that me and people like me aren't going to be the sacrificial offerings upon the altar of your beloved revolution.
Under my UBI revolution, however, there is no need to worry about that because we're changing society by building people up instead of tearing everything down. It is a revolution which is built upon making sure that everyone has everything they need and then showing them where they can get more. It's a revolution which is built on the back of empowerment, not through violent resistance because maybe being free to act violently to conflict takes its own type of privilege. It's not something which everyone is free to do and violence has a tendency to have consequences that you never saw coming. And I get it. I get the whole dichotomy of try to fix the system and let people continue suffering, or break it all and take the risk that it spirals out of control. But haven't you all been listening? UBI is about alleviating people's suffering. UBI allows us to change the system and not having to worry about people being left to suffer. We don't have to take the risk of our revolution spiraling out of control or being warped or twisted. Well yeah, there's a risk that someone will take power and will threaten the system we've constructed, but I'll take that risk, a risk that we have tools to handle and deal with, versus having to get an entire violent revolution back on track after it's gone off the rails any day. And besides, I'm not exactly keen on the idea of workers holding all the power, of workers owning the means of production, either because, well, what happens if you can't work? Not even just if you're physically disabled or injured, but what happens if the way in which work in our society operates fundamentally disenfranchises certain people, the autistic and the mentally ill being a great example. As long as your power and your survival in our society is tied to your ability to work, there will always be a hierarchy between those who can work and those who can't. UBI, its ability to allow everyone to survive regardless of whether they work or not, and its endpoint of the eventual abolishment of the concept of capital itself, is the only way to make sure that doesn't happen. Capitalism is not about the worship of money. Capitalism is about the worship of capital. Capital being the thing that society deems gives people its value. Right now it's money, but I'm suspicious that a worker-run society may just be exchanging one type of capital for another. And if anyone sitting there is thinking that this all sounds pretty social democrat, neoliberal, or whatever, I direct you to the writings of my new favorite Marxist thinker, the late Marxist socialist Eric Olin Wright. Just so you all know, I will be demanding that you all read a full course of his literature before I can trust that you can properly engage with these ideas. <laughs> Just kidding, but seriously, I had never heard of him before I started researching for this episode, but his ideas and mine, like, almost completely line up. He says that there are four ways to approach the problem of capitalism. There's smashing capitalism, which is messy and dangerous and almost certainly will not turn out the way you want it to. There's escaping capitalism, which is just running away from the problem. There's taming capitalism, your basic neoliberal social democrat stuff. And there's eroding capitalism, which takes a long time and leaves people to suffer. Wright says, a Marxist says, that the route to the end of capitalism is to tame and then erode. He and I are in agreement that this is exactly what UBI does, and that's exactly why we both advocate for UBI. I don't advocate for it because I'm not a good leftist. I don't advocate for it because I'm looking for easy answers. I advocate for it because I think that this is both the safest and clearest path. I advocate for UBI because I have thought for hours about what's the best route we as left-wing people can take, and this is the decision I've come to. I should say that I would like it if we solved climate change first. I think it would be nice. And if capitalism collapses during that process, then great. But I'm not holding my breath, and we as a movement need a route forward. UBI is the route I think we need to go down. But hey, I'm open to other suggestions. If anyone has any other things that we can do as a movement that will simultaneously end homelessness, gut prisons, give workers more power and improve working conditions, help people running away from abusive situations, empower people to better themselves, improve the situation of disabled people, redistribute wealth, make everyone in our society healthier, change society's relationship with work and capital, and fundamentally decouple the two of them from each other, allow the most vulnerable and in need in our society to get everything they require, and set the stage for the end of capitalism itself all at the same time, then please. I'm all ears. I'm waiting. Hopefully I've been able to convince you, but if I haven't, then that's fine. I at least hope that I've been able to make you see things from my perspective. And if all of this still isn't enough to at least get you to see my viewpoint as valid and legitimate, well then it was probably never going to be enough, huh? Either way, sorry that this episode was so long. I've been trying to get away from longer episodes, but sometimes I just can't help it. This was a really long topic, and I had a lot of thoughts to get out. As always, like, share, follow, rate, etc, etc. Follow the show and me on Twitter. Feel free to put any more objections you may have down in the comments, and I'll do my best to engage with them. And as much as I wish it was, UBI ain't here yet. So if you think what I'm doing here is good, if you want it to improve, or if you just want to help someone who really, really needs it right now, please consider supporting the show on Patreon if you have the means to do so. Every dollar really does make a huge difference in my life, and you'll be able to play a part in making the show better, as well as get rewards for all the help you give. But anyway, 
Until next time, may the privilege be with you. Stay entitled, Snowflakes. Thank <laughs> you.